and welcome everybody. I'm going to say this straight off. I am not as energetic right now uh, today as I was initially for this video because I have already recorded this video once and I don't know exactly what happened, but the audio is just completely unusable. In fact, it sounds like this. Hello and welcome everybody. And so obviously um I can't use that and so I just have to do a replay video. I have done it several times on the channel before, and as you already know, it's not my preference, but regardless, it is necessary, especially as we're here for match five of this league. It is quite possible that some of you prefer the style of replay sort of video, and if that's the case, then let me know in the comments because that would be very intriguing for me to know. But regardless, we're gonna do the replay, and that's the best that I can do for you today, so I apologize. I was really hoping to get this out today on Friday, uh, the day of recording, but we'll see. We'll see. If it's out today, then you will know that it's because of a distinct grind, determination to get this video out for you guys. Anyways, hopefully you'll follow me into the game in just a couple seconds. All right, guys, we are here for game one against this opponent, Junoa7. And we are on the draw. A little unfortunate, but that's okay. Let's see what we get with the hands here. We are greeted by a Yorion Sky Nomad. Uh, for those of you who are unaware, this is the companion that forces you to play 80 cards in your deck at least. And it is able to flicker some creatures or other permanents when it enters the battlefield. Basically, a very value-oriented card. And of course, when we see this, our first notion is some kind of slower, mid-rangey, like, controlling deck. Uh, my first thought was in the vein of the Yorion Bant decks that played Ice Fang Quaddle and, like, Astrolabe, which is now banned. Um, but they could still play things like Abundant Growth or um, even something like Bant Soul Herder might decide to play Yorion. So I'm thinking of something more mid-rangey along those lines. And we are greeted by the following hand. Two lands, a couple grazers, a three drop, a uh, dryad at that, and a couple of titans. Notably, we're lacking very heavily on the land department. Uh, we also don't have a bounce land or a garenbrig to fuel this hand, and considering grazer is one of the worst cards in our deck against a slower, more controlling opponent, we do decide to ship this one back. And our next hand is, as you see on the screen, right here. <laughs> Good old six lands and a grazer. Um, well, I mean, if the last hand was lacking lands, this hand is the polar opposite of it. We have almost nothing but lands, and like I said, we're not expecting Grazer to be particularly valuable in the matchup at this point. Of course, you all will know what the matchup is because you've seen it on the YouTube title of this video in the thumbnail, but at this point in time, I didn't know, and I don't even necessarily think, knowing what our opponent was playing, that this hand is still a keep. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Let me know in the comments what you think about that, but... Obviously, we can't keep a six land hand against a control opponent if that's what our opponent is playing, so we ship that one back as well. And we keep the following hand. Uh, here we have all of the lands we could possibly need. Uh, we have Bounce Land and Garenbrig, which is fantastic for bridging towards Titan here. We have an untapped source, quote unquote, with Vestige. We got a couple of threats, so obviously we have to keep this. And the next choice is about what to bottom. And we choose to bottom a Bounce Land and the Karn. And here's the reasoning behind that. What, what, what is going on? It says, it said my opponent disconnected. I don't know what that means, because <clears throat> we're not currently facing a opponent right now, so that's kind of weird. Anyways, um, yeah, we decided to bottom a bounce land, as we are only one land away from Titan mana, and the Crumbly Vestige can, in fact, produce a green for activating Garenbrig if we chose to go that route. And uh, furthermore, um, if we're planning to cast Corn, uh, that's going to be a turn four play at best. We can lead Azusa turn three into Karn in order to have all the mana sources in play, but we're also not getting anything out of Karn until the turn after where we can play whatever we minus to search for. So for that reason, we choose to bottom a land so that we are only one thing short of Titan mana while we still have access to a bounce land to go with our Azusa and the Karn. Casting a Titan on turn four is most likely going to be more impactful than casting a Karn. And yeah, so that's what we choose to do. Our opponent plays turn one Plains Aether Vial. So of course, now we know this is a mono white taxes strategy. 
or potentially mono white. We don't have guaranteed confirmation of that at this point, but of course we draw a dryad and we're just going to play our tap Garenbrig out here and pass it back. Nothing super special about this. Our opponent's Aether Vial does the thing, goes up, and they pass it back. We top deck a Grazer, and that's a decent one. It lets us speed up a bit here. Maybe a land would have been a better draw, but regardless, Grazer is fine. So we're going to throw that one out there and get our Growth Chamber into play. And now we have access to a turn 3-3 three, three drop uh, by virtue of having all of our untapped sources in play. I think we might have already had a turn 3-3 three, three drop here anyways, but regardless, it's still better to go ahead and get some acceleration going. Our opponent uh, plays a Field of Ruin and immediately gets our Growth Chamber out of here. Um, that definitely hurts us since we are, we're lacking on lands in the beginning of the game, and now we're even more so lacking on lands, but at least they're not clocking us. They do have a Aether Vial on 2 out, so they could potentially make a threat that way, but that's okay. And here we choose to go ahead and play our Dryad. And I will say, in retrospect, I personally find this to be a misplay. My thought process was, oh, well, if we're able to get a Titan into play this upcoming turn, then having Dryad in play will be beneficial. Uh, we can start getting Valka triggers and that sort of thing. But as you can tell, there is absolutely no, no way we're casting a Titan this upcoming turn. And in fact, we're just uh, putting a... Great Path to Exile or Skyclave Apparition target into play. So I do think this should have been an Azusa, but, you know, hindsight 2020 and all of that. So our opponent plays Ghost Quarter. The beats don't stop, do they? And they do play Skyclave Apparition to punish our play of playing the Dryad. Um, but they still don't really have a clock, so there's that. We top deck and play a Garen Brig, so we're only a land away from getting Titan mana here. Um, so we are going to go ahead and use our mana and our turn to play the Azusa, as otherwise we'd be doing nothing. Opponent plays a Militia Bugler, which is going to let them look at the top four cards and reveal a creature with a power two or less to put into their hand. So this is good for grinding, but currently we have the battlefield relatively under control, and we're about to get a Titan incoming, so it's pretty good. Uh, of course, our opponent does find a Stoneforge Mystic off of that of note, so we could be facing down a a sort of Feast and Famine, for example. So we'll have to see what our opponent has access to here. They put in another Bugler and pick up a Thalia, um, which is kind of annoying because one of our outs of drawing an untapped land or a bounce land to be able to cast Titan this upcoming turn could become more difficult if our opponent plays a Thalia, uh, as it does cut off those lines. So we'll just have to see if our opponent chooses to play into that or not. Um, they attack with both, and we take our free block with our Grazer here. And our opponent casts Stoneforge Mystic, getting a Maul of the Skyclaves, which is a 3-mana artifact that auto-equips when it comes into play and gives plus 2, plus 2, flying at first strike. Um, that one is also problematic, although we can block with a Grazer. And then they play a second Stoneforge Mystic, which uh, was very surprising to me. Um, and this one gets a Batter Skull, which we don't care too, too much about, in all honesty. And yeah, so we top deck the untapped land, like a boss, of course, and we play it, name Giant, because why not, and get our bad boy into play. No time like the present, into play it goes. And here we go for the search. Um, the only thing we can really do here is try to set up a line that lets us get to Dryad. Um, so here we choose to get Simic Growth Chamber and Talari West, as really there are no other good options. It's not like we have enough land names for Feel the Dead or anything, so... Our opponent immediately fires off their Ghost Quarter on our Talari West, which does make sense. Uh, we get our basic land here to replace. We pick up the Bounce Land for repeated plays with a Feel the Dead, for example, if we're able to get a Feel the Dead into the play. Uh, that, along with uh, Bounce Land and Azusa, will potentially, potentially represent a clock, or at least a way to block our opponent's creatures. It's better to have Bounce Land in hand here. Our opponent Winds of Abandons are Titan. Uh, Little Path to Exile substitute here. Probably Path to Exile's 5 through 8, or however many copies of Winds our opponent happens to be playing. So, of course, they answer our Titan, which cuts us further off of getting something like uh, Field of the Dead or Dryad with Valakut in play. Things are looking pretty bad at this point. Our opponent just uh, commits to the attack here. And <clears throat> we do know that our opponent has Maul of the Skyclave, so all they have to do is activate Stoneforge and put Maul into play. But if they do that, they're not able to get their Batter Skull into play, and obviously we're probably playing an Azusa this upcoming turn anyways, um, so we'd rather absorb the damage. Even if our opponent puts a Maul into play, at least we gain 3 life from blocking with our Azusa, and otherwise our Azusa is not going to be doing much anyways. 
since we have a backup copy, we don't care for losing it, and we'd rather just make sure our opponent doesn't get a bad school into play this turn. And, of course, our opponent goes for the mall play, take their free value while they can get it. Whatever, we don't care. To be honest, it might have been better to just go ahead and commit the batter skull there and just let us not take the one point of damage or whatever. But that's okay. We pay for our summoner's pack trigger here. Draw and play a Radiant Fountain and an Azusa. And yeah, I'm not really sure if there's anything we can draw at this point, but we'll find out. Our opponent goes for the attacks here. And here we're going to block and keep our Azusa in play this time in case we were to top deck something like Field of the Dead or a Titan to go search for Field of the Dead, for example. Um, that would allow us multiple plays of Growth Streamer to make some blockers for our opponent's creatures, except for the one that has Flying. Of course, we can block the Flying one next turn with Grazer, since Grazer has Reach. Fantastic card. Um, yeah, I mean, that's about all we can do. Our opponent finally commits their Thalia, and we top deck a another land. And yeah, that's obviously not beating our opponent's current board state. So, on to game two. All right, guys, we are here for the sideboarding uh, just before the second game in our match here. And the cards that we brought in, you can see right here, and the cards that we took out were right here. We are taking out the Explorers here because they're taxed by our opponent's Thalia, Guardian of Thraven, which is not an effect that we really want to let our opponent have access to uh, making our Explorers 3-drops. They're not that good. They're, they're not as good as Dryad is as a 3-drop. So anyways, we're going to go ahead and trim on those. Uh, we're also cutting one Summoner's Pact in case our opponent shows us any kind of search hate, like a uh, Avon Mind Sensor or a Leon and Arbiter. It's very possible our opponent has access to those. Um, and then we also are trimming the Bajuka Bog, as it obviously doesn't really do anything against our opponent. They're not using their graveyard, presumably. And Cavernous Holes, as it's an overglorified force here, uh, we didn't see any blue lands on our opponent's deck. There's probably not counter magic. And we side in Dismembers, obviously, to interact with their creatures, especially if they do have, like, a Stoneforge Mystic or Leonin Arbiter in the play that we need to dismember. Um, we bring in Rex Sage and Beast Within to deal with the odd um, Sword of Feast and Famine or so. Um, we're not bringing in the uh, second Beast Within, actually, because having Karn, the Great Creator, in your deck gives you some outs against those equipment as your opponent can't actually equip a creature with the sword as long as you have a Karn in play as well as the fact that Karn can minus four explosives from the sideboard to deal with a uh, potential sword. So we're only bringing in one beast within, and we do bring in one of the two explosives from the sideboard. Uh, we choose to leave one explosives in the sideboard that we can get with our Karn, so that our Karn is able to interact with our opponent's battlefield. Um, we'll see if that becomes relevant, but I will say that I uh, redacted this change and bring in the, th the third explosives from the sideboard for game three, um, because... I realize after the fact that carning for an Engineered Explosives, while it's good, usually carning for a Sky Sovereign will do about the same thing. If you're able to get a Karn into play and have the safety to minus it for interaction, Sky Sovereign is probably the best piece of interaction that you can get. And uh, we'll realize soon enough that having the Explosives in your hand is far better than having to get Karn into play and then minus Karn to get Explosives and then still play and pop Explosives. That's a lot of mana for that particular effect. So, but regardless, we leave the explosives in play for this game, and we'll see how it plays out. I will see you guys in the match. All right, guys, we are here for the match, and of course, we're on the play, so that is already something good to go off of here. We do choose to play first, of course, and we are greeted with the following hand. We have a double bounce land, a Valakut naturally already in the hand, an untapped green source. We have a grazer, we have explosives to interact, and we already have a titan in hand. All we're missing is a three drop, like, I don't know, Dryad maybe. <laughs> and then we'll have everything we need, as well as a little bit of interaction. So this is obviously a fantastic hand, and we do, in fact, keep it. And we're going to lead on Shock, a Breeding Pool, cast our Boreal Grazer here, putting into play a Bounce Land, so that if we do top deck a three drop like a Dryad, we can Shock in Breeding Pool once again, taking a, another two points of damage, to get that 3-drop into play, such as a Dryad or a Zusa, as speeding up our lands will be quite effective this hand. It also allows us to play and blow Engineered Explosives on 1 if our opponent leads on Aether Vial, which is a very reasonable thing to do. They get a lot of oomph from Aether Vial if they have it, so that's the reasoning behind that choice. And yeah, our opponent plays turn 1 Giver of Runes and passes it back. That's not a 1-drop that we particularly care to deal with for Explosives, so obviously we're not worried about that. And 
since we do draw a Karn the Great Creator, we're playing out the Valakut here as our tap source, so we can shock Breeding Pool and get Karn to play this upcoming turn if we want to, or just play Explosives on two and blow it up if our opponent plays something like a Stoneforge Mystic or a Leonin Arbiter. So we do choose to play out the Valakut here, of course. I suppose there could have been a consideration to playing Explosives on two preemptively here. Um, maybe that would have been a good play, but I didn't think about it in the moment, and I haven't really thought about it much now. Eh. I mean, we have time here. I suppose... Knowing that our opponent played a Stoneforge Mystic, already having Explosives on two in play here, it would have been all right, but it's whatever. Our opponent does commit a Stoneforge Mystic, uh, getting a Maul of the Skyclaves yet again, and they pass it back, of course. And here, while we draw an additional land, we choose to go ahead and shock our Breeding Pool and play Karn the Great Creator, and here is the reasoning why. If our opponent chooses to clock our Karn for the maximum number of damage that they can do, um, that would be hard casting Maul of the Skyclaves on three mana, attaching it to the Stoneforge, giving the Stoneforge protection from green with Giver of Runes, and attacking for three at our Karn. After we plus our Karn, it's going to be at three uh, after taking this damage. Uh, it'll go to six and then take three damage down to three, and it'll still be able to minus and stick around. Um, that's good enough for me, and yeah, I mean, our opponent doesn't have anything to meaningfully clock this Karn, is basically what I'm getting at here, so. We're going to go ahead and play the Karn and, of course, plus it so that we don't have to lose it if we do choose to minus it this upcoming turn or just lose it to our opponent going for the exact line that we talked about. They lead off on giving the uh, Stoneforge Mystic protection from green and no third land. They choose to just go ahead and straight away attack Karn for one. Again, that's not really a meaningful clock, so that's fine. They do have the third land, so they just chose not to go for them all. And instead, they commit a Leon and Arbiter to the battlefield which our explosives, which was already probably going to be on two anyways, really likes to see. <laughs> so we choose to play our explosives on two here. And if we play our amulet out here before we choose to crack our explosives, I do some deliber deliberation while I figure out this line. I almost just go ahead and pop explosives. But I determine that already having an amulet in play at the start of this upcoming turn, even if we don't make any additional land drop progress this turn, will give us access to Titan Mana, as we have the four in play, plus a Rot Farm that gets on tap from the Amulet. That allows us to play Titan this upcoming turn. Um, and so, uh, if we play Amulet and use a Rot Farm to activate Explosives here and clear our opponent's battlefield, we'll still have access to Titan this upcoming turn. Um, and obviously, that's what we want access to here. So we play our Amulet, we play out our Bounce Land, we pop this Explosives, get those off the battlefield, and we just pick up a Bounce Land here. We plus our Karn because there's no real point in mining it. We could get like Pithy Needle or something, but what are we going to name? And we pass it back. Our opponent plays a Militia Bugler to grind here, but huh, nothing grinds better than Karn Father himself as we minus Karn, getting the best card in the Karn board, Sky Sovereign, the boat. We're going to play our land, play that one out, and shoot down our opponent's Giver of Runes. Of course, if they if we shot our opponent's bugler, they could give it protection from colorless with their giver. So there's no point in doing that. And besides, we actually don't care about this bugler at all. Um, I suppose they could play Maul and path our grazer and attack to kill our Karn. But even then, we just you know fetch, play Titan, get some lands with it, crew Sky Sovereign, go to town, just have everything we want in the world. And yeah, we don't really care at this point, so we just go ahead and shoot down the giver. Um, they give protection from colorless and response as if that makes any real difference. And we pass it back. Our opponent clocks with the Militia Bugler at our Karn. Uh, that's a free attack, and we take our free block. They don't have anything to punish us here, of course. So they play out their Flicker Wisp to get some additional value with their Bugler. I don't really know what they're looking for here, but... Whatever it is, they're not going to find it. Um, we top deck a Summoner's Pact, which is an amazing draw, because now we can play our Rot Farm and f go find a Dryad with our Summoner's Pact, play the Dryad, and still have six mana to cast Titan with a replay of the Rot Farm here. So that lets us play a round path to exile, which is also one of the reasons why we chose to go with Sky Sovereign the previous turn instead of playing a Titan, is if we play Titan and go for a Haste Line, we get blown up by Path to Exile. Um, there's nothing really to search for there. Um, and Clearly going for the Sky Sovereign was a uh, superior line, in my opinion. So here, we do the pack thing, grab our Dryad and play it out. Play out our Bounce Land, float uh, six mana here, pick up a Bounce Land for future use with Dryad, play Titan, 
search for Hanweer and second Valkut as now our opponent has to deal with all these Valkut triggers going to their creatures in their face while also dealing with the onboard Primeval Titan and Sky Sovereign plus active Karn the Great Creator. Um, and our opponent sees the writing on the wall. They let us stack these things and they go ahead and hit the concede button. And we are off to game three after some quick changes. So I will see you guys for the sideboarding for game three. All right, guys. So we are here for the sideboarding. Just a small pivot here before game three. We do bring in the second explosives uh, and take out a second summoner's pact. We did see our opponent with copies of Leon and Arbiter. So we know for sure that they are playing some serious heavy hate against our search effects. And for that reason, we want to trim down on summoner's pact just a little bit to be a little more insulated against that potential threat. And yeah, we're off into game three. I will see you guys there. Okay, so game three. We are on the draw, of course. Our opponent chooses to play first. Um, they go ahead and keep their seven. And we keep our seven, as it does have everything that we want access to. Um, we drew the grazer for turn, but even without the grazer, we have interaction in the form of engineered explosives. We have a dryad to potentially combo with Valcut if we get our Titan into play. We do have a Garenbrig to accelerate here and. All we need to do is pick up a couple lands. Even one single bounce land would be enough to make this hand live. Of course, if our opponent doesn't have a Ghost Quarter or Field of Ruin effect. Um, but yeah, so we top deck Grazer, and we were already planning on playing out this uh, Windswept Heath here and fetching it immediately so our opponent can't just play a turn two Leon and Arbiter and make our life difficult. Uh, we are going to fetch Shock of Breeding Pool to fix for our Talari West mana, and we go ahead and commit the Grazer, putting in Talari West so that we can play Garen Brig and cast our through drop this up a coming turn if we do decide to do that. Our opponent plays their second land drop, Leon and Arbiter, uh, which we very kindly to ourselves played around by going ahead and fetching the Windswept Teeth, so that uh, play ended up working out pretty all right, if I dare say. And here we have a little bit of deliberation to do as we draw our third copy of Primeval Titan. Um, if we choose to commit our Dryad, we're giving our opponent a nice, juicy target for their Skyclave Apparition. That is a big no-no. Um, but it's also worth noting that if we play our Explosives, our opponent can Skyclave that one too. So we can't just play Explosives on two and pass here, as our opponent could still Skyclave away our Explosives, and that might be even more devastating than Skyclaving our Dryad here. And so we do choose to go for the Dryad here, I believe. Um, as the explosives, getting this Arbiter out of play is going to be more important, I think, than having this Dryad in play. Um, our explosives is going to need to deal with this Arbiter so we can search with our Titan. So, anyways, we do commit the Dryad to the board. It's also the most mana efficient play. And <laughs> our opponent continues rolling with the punches with a Ghost Quarter here. We can't even search thanks to Leon and Arbiter, of course. And they play a Giver of Runes and pass it right back to us. Now we have no choice but to play our explosives on two. And yeah, that's all we can really do. We attack as our opponent can just um, block and give protection later on. So we're not going to be able to get this two points of damage in. But also, if they wanted to attack through our blockers anyways, they can just give her to give protection from green and swing with their Arbiter. So it's not like our Dryad is a meaningful blocker here. So we put our opponent to the Valcut relevant 18 life points and continue the game. Our opponent swings with their Arbiter. Uh, we block with our Grazer, like, okay. That was uh, kind of pointless, but that's okay. Our opponent plays Skyclave Apparition to exile our Engineered Explosives, so clearly we valued correctly that we would need this Engineered Explosives more so than the Dryad, but unfortunately our opponent did have the time and ability to play their Skyclave to get our Explosives out of play. Things are looking pretty difficult. Um, we draw an amulet, which is actually a fantastic draw, because if we do pick up a copy of the bounce land here, we will not be able to search with our Titan Trigger from the Leon and Arbiters uh, taxing. But at the very least, we can get a 6-6 trampling body in play, and that is not nothing. So then from that point on, we could pay two and attack and search with Titan and get out of this situation that way. So amulet is actually a fantastic top deck, but one of the best ones that we could have drawn. And here we are going to go ahead and pass it back as attacking into our opponent's onboard Protection from green plus block doesn't make any sense, so. And our opponent does send in with a Skyclave uh, with the protection here to put a little bit of clock on us. Uh, currently, they didn't really have much of a clock anyway, so we could easily dig out of this. 
but our opponent happens to play a Blast Zone. And that one is really brutal. It gets rid of their giver, but that is a small price to pay to get our amulet out of play, as our amulet was the real prize here. And yeah, now we don't really have a, any route to Titan mana. Very unfortunate. We draw another explosives, play that thing on two, um, pass it back as our opponent can't attack us through the Dryad, as if they swung with both, we get to block and kill the Arbiter or the Skyclave. And that's not a good exchange for two points of damage. So our opponent plays a Bugler. They're grinding, which usually wouldn't be the best option against an amulet strategy. But when we're so low on lands and uh, therefore resources, I mean, this grinding might work out for our opponent. Um, what do they find? Stoneforge Mystic. Yikes. Okay. Um, so we're going to play out a Crumbling Vestas that we just drew and go ahead and commit our Azusa to play here. If we do draw a bounce land, we can still pick up and transmute Solari West for a second bounce land to bridge our way to Titan mana anyways, so there's no real reason to hold on to the Vestige here, and might as well get our Azusa into play. And yeah, that's about all that we can say about that. There's no real point in blowing explosives here, as our opponent's about to come into Stoneforge Mystic to the battlefield that'll also get eaten up by explosives inevitably, so... We see a huh, Sword of Fire and Ice from our opponent, which is... A huge problem. And they equip their Bugler here. And they go for the combat. They go for the attack. Um, and we're going to go ahead and choose to block with our Azusa. As our Azusa is just going to die to the sword trigger. Doing two damage to any target. If we don't block. So we are basically forced into blocking with Azusa. As it prevents them from drawing a card. And all that good stuff. So our Azusa dies. We draw another Azusa. Not the best, but let's just play a Runs Repeat of last turn, I guess. Opponent finally commits their Stoneforge Mystic. Not like that's a great thing for us, but at least we can sweep it up with Explosives. They pay two to search with their Arbiter here, since uh, their Arbiter does hose their own Stoneforge Mystic. And they find a Maul of the Skyclaves. This is a problem, as it's now going to allow their Sworded Creature to fly, uh, so we're really under the pressure here. I'm not sure... At this point, if we really have any top decks that will allow us to win the game here, I suppose we could draw a Beast Within to answer the Sword. That might be good enough, or the Maul, perhaps. But, um, yeah, Karn, not really going to do it here. Can't even cast it, so we'll do what we can. Blow our Explosives, pass it back. No point in attacking, not like we can block either. Skyclave to say goodbye to our Dryad. This card is very good, in case you haven't noticed. Skyclave Apparition really is the real deal, so it's a very good card. And yeah, we're pretty much dead at this point, but we'll try to play out as long as we can. Top deck a land. We can transmute for something. Um, of course, we actually are going for the meme here to transmute for the least useful card as possible in this scenario, which probably, in my opinion, would have been Forest. Um, we're just doing this for the meme before we concede, because we might as well have a little bit of fun with our opponent, uh, even if we are losing. And our opponent shows us Aven Mind Sensor. Insult to injury. Luckily, we're still able to find our basic forest here, and we still got our meme, but clearly this was not a game that we were meant to win. So I've got the deck list back together here in its full glory to talk about the wrap-up. We did end up 3-2, and two, as I said before, and that is good enough to get our value back, plus a little bit more. So, never complaining about a 3-2. and two. Um, Very fun to play. Always a charm to be able to minus Karn for a Sky Sovereign and it be a good play. I know a lot of Karn lists don't play it. Regardless, let's discuss for just a second here Karn the Great Creator and what role Karn plays in Amulet Titan. So... The idea behind Karn, of course, as you may know by this point, is to provide additional cards here to force our opponent to interact, uh, waste their resources dealing with a Karn in order for us to bridge to I'm Evil Titan. It gives us additional threats that get underneath Aether Gust in the control matchup, and that's where it really shines is in the control matchup. When I'm playing Amulet against a blue-white Bant or blue-black control opponent, Karn is going to be one of the best things that you could possibly be doing. It still gets hit by Force Negation, but that's a small price to pay for a threat that is played early and unexpectedly and does not get hit by the best sideboard card they can possibly have against us, which is Aethergust. But 
including Karn in your deck, does do some damage. And that's what I wanted to talk about briefly. Um, Karn is not particularly good against aggressive strategies, and those are pretty prevalent in modern at the moment, though we didn't really face a whole lot of them, if I'm not mistaken, in this league. Prowess and Death Shadow are very prevalent in the meta, and Karn really is very lackluster against those strategies. Uh, playing Karn on turn 3 or turn 4 to then play an Explosives on turn 4 or turn 5 after we play the Karn, and then losing the Karn to our opponent's likely attacking board state, I mean, that's just not good. You're going to lose the Karn if you don't lose the game, and you're really just uh, wasting your time if you're not just casting Primeval Titan in those matchups. And having Karns in your deck at all in the first place, rather than additional copies of Explorer, for example, or Azusa, or um, even just additional land drops, maybe like another Bounce Land or another Basic Land so you can cast a Grazer on one or whatever, these cards help you get to a point where you can outpace your opponent or outmuscle them with your Primeval Titans. Karn is not really doing it in those matchups. And for my personal taste, I think that Karn is not really the move if you want to be playing the most competitive version of Amulet. But then again, I will concede it's not always about competitiveness. Karn is massively fun to play. I really enjoy playing Karn. And even if it's not the most competitive option, if you want to play Karn for your own enjoyment and you just like the card, then by all means, do so. I don't look down on anybody for playing this game for fun and just playing the cards that they like. I do the same thing myself. I happen to be a little bit of a sucker for Explorer and for Esper Charm and Path to Exile. Um, these are all cards that I'll play until the end of the format <laughs> at this point. And yeah, if that's your goal, then Karn definitely fills that goal. It is slightly worse in some matchups, and I think that a Karn list is pretty prone to three and two type of records where you pick up a couple losses against the matchups where Karn is not as effective. I think that you can simplify your deck a little bit and have more game against these aggressive strategies by making a simple inclusion of a single Pact of Negation in the main board. You don't need to play additional threats. Just get a Pact of Negation in there so you can transmute for it. Play a second Cavern of Souls and side border in the main board, which you can't really do when you're trying to make a room for Karns while still playing a couple turn timber symbiosis. Um, these are very easy changes that you can make to help improve your control game. And I will admit, I do think the control matchup is not a good one for Amulet, but I found it to be far from the worst. And I don't think that including Karn in your deck and making your aggro matchup significantly worse is worth it for the effect. Um, in fact, I actually think that a good option for having additional threats that get underneath Aethergust that is relatively underexplored in Amulet, although I've played it every once in a while, is Golos Tireless Pilgrim as a mini primeval titan. It can do some very cool things. It lets you commit a threat that helps set up your Dryad or helps you find a Talari West to set up a titan uh, very easily. If you wanted to try something like Karn, it gives you an additional threat against control while also having some serviceability against aggro. I highly suggest testing that out. Even that, I'm not sure, is better than just playing something more streamlined. But regardless, one small note here about the deck list. The only place I can really see for improvement is getting these negates out of here, playing something else. If you're already playing Karns, you don't really want additional cards in the sideboard dedicated to the control matchup. Probably not worth it. In fact, I would cut these two and just get some other cards Maybe a Force of Vigor, for example, would be a good inclusion. Something along those lines. I don't know. Uh, Obstinate Baloth for those aggro matchups to go along with these explosives could be very potent, in my opinion. Um, also, I'm not sure how necessary it is to be playing Turn Timber Symbiosis in this deck list. Um, yeah, that's all I can really say about it. If you have any thoughts, uh, let me know. One of my subscribers did, in fact leave a comment uh, explaining that they are playing Ancient Stirrings in lieu of some of the cards here, the main board explosives uh, and uh, one copy of Azusa to play a couple copies of Ancient Stirrings. And I could see that being a nice way to tie together, having additional bounce lands, having access to your Karns and Talari West and that kind of thing. And so perhaps that's another thing to explore if you want to try a list. Anyways, that person knows who they are, so I don't feel the need to call them out specifically. But yeah. Anyways, that's a way too much talking for a video where I didn't actually technically play. So I will see you guys in the next league. This is Red Face Menace, signing off.